coming. I guess they had to chase some people away. It's like a Trump rally, you know. You have, what a great crowd it is. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that's it. So thank you for Beatri to Beatrice for inviting me. I think we've known each other forever. This is really a pleasure. Um, this is very meaningful for me. My family was incarcerated in Heart Mountain, Tule Lake, and Gila River during the war. Of course, my father and my uncles were in the US Armed Services, but everybody else was, was incarcerated. So this is the narrative that I really grew up with in my childhood, and it has so much meaning for me because I knew it was a dangerous story. Um, growing up here in Los Angeles, I was told by one of my teachers that my mother and grandmother were lying about their history in the camp, and they fabricated the story. Um, so I knew it was dangerous. I knew at the age of 10 that's a story I had to keep on telling. And um, particularly today, it's really, you know, in this historic moment, so many Americans are under attack, their constitutional rights are under attack by racial hatred. Um, this story really is something we forget at our peril. Another reason, and Beatrice, I'm going on a little bit because Beatrice asked me to contextualize uh, Mary's story, her personal story of the larger kind of picture of the 120,000 um, Japanese Americans who were incarcerated and in prison um, during the war. In fact, this is the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, um, which uh, resulted in the evacuation and imprisonment of those Japanese Americans. Uh, 75 years ago in August, probably Mary and other Japanese Americans, I know my mother was living in the Santa Anita racetrack in Arcadia, California, in the horse stalls, and they were being uh, taken from the Tanferan racetrack, Santa Anita, where, wherever they were, and taken to these godforsaken places um, around the West where they were um, prisoned behind barbed wire. And that was probably about this time, 75 years ago. Um, and the, the, the story of people like uh, Mary and the um, incarcerated Japanese Americans is not only a story, I think, of victims at all, because they had this vital, you know, created community in the camps, they created art and culture in the camps, and they cultivated agriculture in places that were barren before the Japanese Americans arrived places like um, Heart Mountain. Um, they performed like Mary performed. Um, they painted, they carved, they built swimming holes, they had Boy Scout troops and baseball teams. And it's really, it, the places like Manzanar, where Mary was incarcerated, were sites of resistance, collective resistance, individual acts of resistance, as well as these sites of this very, very vital um, building of Japanese American community. The other part of the story, Mary's story, that's really important to me is this really forgotten story of Nisei, Japanese American performers of that era. Um, there were these amazing talents like Mary, people like who were a little older than her, like um, Fumi Kawabata, um, Betty Inada, who were you know, incredible dancers, singers, musicians. Um, they had to confront racism in the entertainment business. Uh, they couldn't get into musicians' unions. Um, because of racism, they couldn't get, you know, uh, roles on screen or on stage. Some of them went back to Japan in the 1930s, um, were trapped there during the war. Uh, some of them ended up in camps. Some of them took on Chinese stage, stage names. So they went as these incredible talents were not able to actualize um, their, their talents in this broader kind of stage, although they created something wherever they were. They created something in their communities, in Little Tokyo, in Manzanar, um, wherever they could. They left this legacy, and they left their voice, and were so happy that Mary left this just spectacular voice, a voice we get to hear today. Um, so with that, I'll shut up, because I'm sure you want to hear from Cody, the filmmaker, and from Mary herself. 
And what we'll do today is um, I'll have a, a short discussion with the both of them, and then we'll open it up to you for questions and comments. So Mary and Cody, you join me? I know, Mary, these are really high. I don't think I can get up on, yeah. I think we'll both need help getting up on these. OK. You OK? okay. See if I can get up there. Oh, maybe. I think so. I, I can actually get up. OK. Um, let me start uh, with a few questions for Cody. So Cody, I, I read your biography. You're from Chicago. Cubs are ahead, the <laughs> bottom of the fourth, in five to three, so we're really happy. Um, and then you went to, uh, you studied at CalArts. You divide your time between Santa Fe and Los Angeles. How did you find out about Mary's story? What brought you to Mary? OK. Well, first I want to say, when I met Mary, I always kind of dreamed that I could show the film and have her hear and have her sing. I think that completes what my experience with her was all about music, but there's a lot to the story. Um, I was for a long time focused on photography. And while my grandmother was alive, I went to a, um, a group of her and German widows were singing war songs. And I guess in the first time in my experience as a photographer, I thought, oh, thank you. I thought, I can't make photographs. This is something I have to film. I'm hearing music and I'm thinking, these are important songs. This is here in California. And from that experience, I was thinking, well, what about that really resonated with me? And I was thinking about generations who are affected by war, what happens, the generations that follow, and I thought music was a really interesting access point because I saw my grandma and these uh, war brides, they were just like little girls. They were so happy, and in a way, I thought it was like music that was healing them. So I made a film about them, and I came to Southern California, and someone introduced me to Scott Nakatani, and after I uh, got to meet him and speak to him about his music, which maybe I could talk a little bit more about later, he introduced me to Mary. And I came and met Mary, and we had some tea. And at the very end of the meeting, she sang for me, and I just couldn't believe who I had just met. Her, it was maybe one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. You just got to see Embraceable Me. And I thought, well, that has to be the end of the film. So that's kind of the path that led me to Mary. And did you know anything about the incarceration camps before you met Mary? Well, um, I did. When 9-11 uh, happened, I had just turned 12, and my school gave us Farewell to Manzanar. And I read that as a kid, and that stuck with me my whole life. Mary, do you remember first meeting Cody? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> just another one of your guys, right? <laughs> okay. No, I was so you to meet him, and he was so sweet. And Oh, my. he was so sincere, and it was easy. It was easy for me to to love him. Can you hear Mary? Oh, back oh there? I didn't put oh, the okay. microphone up. Yeah. Do you want to say that again? <laughs> <laughs> but did you hear back there? Now we go. My voice is so low and loud, so maybe you thought I had this thing. <laughs> but anyway, I. Just really appreciate what he did, and I can never thank you enough for making him feel like I'm important. <laughs> thank you. So, um, Cody, were there any surprises as you were um, delving into Mary's story and the story of the um, Japanese American concentration camps? Anything of the history, or her personal history, or just her? Kind of personality that really jolted you? Um, well, so you're asking me anything that surprised me? Um, you know, I, I learned a lot from Mary's values, and to hear her story, 
I have some text that accompanies the video where she told me about her mother who sang Japanese classical music and how she would listen to it and memorize all the parts which were sung by men. And, you know, just, you were born a performer. You heard those songs and you sang, your mom heard you singing it one day and thought, oh, she's good. So you start doing talent shows. Um, in terms of surprise, I'm not sure. Um, did your grandmother ever meet Mary? My grandma did not meet Mary. They were the same generation. Well, yeah. And Mary, can you talk a little bit about before the war, you grew up here on the west side, right? in Venice, you said? Right in Venice, uh huh? Well, I was wow. talking about uh -huh. Yeah, I started the third grade here in Venice and um, went to junior high there. And here, I mean, in high school, I was in the 11th grade when the uh, uh, 9066 came out and I was uh, told we had to leave. And I was living with my brother and my two sisters and my, little, my two older sisters and two little sister. And we had no parents. I lost them when I was four, year, four years old, my father and my mother, I lost when I was eight years old. So my brother raised us, quitting high school, and uh, he and his, uh, uh, my sister, who was uh, just a year and a half or so younger than he, they both quit high school to raise us. And in those days, it was you know, depression years. And so it was the 1930s. And uh, so he knew how much I loved music. And in those days, I mean, we barely had money to put on the, to buy groceries to feed us. And, but somehow or other, he was able to scrape up 50 cents a week for me to go take singing lessons. And that's how I learned how to breathe and sing and all that. But I, I just owe it all to my brother. So for, to honor him, I, or I named my first son after him. And, uh, and we just, we survived in Venice, so I have good memories of Venice. And well, if I like can add, when you were taking those music lessons, mm -hmm. I think the thing that surprised me was when you told me about Ralph Snyder. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, who was he? He was a pianist for an all-time musician, a mus uh, orchestra, Paul Whiteman. I don't know if any of you know who Paul Whiteman was, but he had my, my singing teacher was his pianist. His brother played the guitar. And the boys, there were three boys in the back who sang the songs you know, of the current era. And one of those boys, well, the, name was, um, the name of the boys was the Rhythm Boys. And one member was Bing Crosby. And we had a picture of the whole orchestra of Paul Whiteman standing there. He and my singing teacher were playing the piano. And in the back, three young men. And lo and behold, it's Bing Crosby. And, and I can't find that picture, my <laughs> I, uh, I had it several years, I saw it several years ago. But my brother must not have uh, put it away in a safe place. And we could not find it after my brother passed. And we looked and looked and couldn't find it. But that was history, Paul Whiteman. So what were your dreams before the war? What, what did you, how did you? see yourself, what hopes did you have? Well, you, I knew that I would never be a, in the movies. They don't take little old squatty old Japanese girls in the movies. So I always wanted to be a singer on the radio where they won't see me, but they'll hear my voice. And that's what I always wanted to do is sing for, on the radio and make records. So when you went to Manzanar, it's, did you go directly to Manzanar yes, or were you we at? directly, uh-huh, so on the bus. Can you tell me, did you think about, you know, what's going to happen to my career? What was, or was it just like your, like, very fundamental worries that you had? I had no inkling of, of what I wanted to be at that time. I was just a little snot, a little 16-year-old that was very naive and didn't know much about the world. And I said, hey, we're going to go to the camp. Hey, we're going to go someplace. I never got to go anywhere on a trip out of Venice. And so... I'm going to go to a camp. And we got in this rickety old bus and traipsed about, oh gosh, it must have been seven, eight hours, all the way from Venice, all the way to Manzanar. And we stopped at the gate and we looked and said, this is where we're going to live? This is the camp? Dusty, cold, 
dirty, and people looking up into the bus, seeing who's on the bus, maybe one of our friends or one of our relatives, because they went in groups, uh, groups of um, uh, sections where they lived in L.A. or uh, Santa Monica or Venice, so they were all looking for their friends. And how those people looking at us? They had World War Two, World War One uniforms on to keep them warm. The little hat caps and and jackets. They're all in khaki, and it was a shock. I mean, they had goggles on because of the sand was blowing in their eyes, and I mean, it was a shock. And I was only 16, but I thought, wow, this is where we're gonna live with them. How long? We had no idea. And and as we, as the days went by, they told us what we had to do and what they expected us, of us, and it was no picnic. It was, it was a shock. If you don't know where Manzanar is, you can visit. It's near Lone Pine and Bishop in the Mojave Desert, right? Mm -hmm. It's still kind of godforsaken, um, but they have a really amazing new interpretive center that the National Park Service has, has put up a lot of great history there. And every year in April, there is a pilgrimage. Um, the community takes a lot of young people, people of all different backgrounds, and they um, pay tribute and, and tour the camps. Now, I, I think I saw a picture of you at the pilgrimage. No? You mean just recently? Yes. I was there, uh -huh, but uh, I didn't know about the picture. <laughs> Well, we don't go every year for our pilgrimage, but when my husband passed, he said he wanted his ashes strewn over the Sierras. And I could not afford to hire an airplane to have do that. So we, as a family, took his ashes out to Manzanar and near the creek, the Shepherd's Creek, and we scattered his ashes. And we paid our own private tribute to him, and my daughter brought flowers out of her garden, and we all each threw, had the grass, uh, place the flowers in the water and, and bade him goodbye. And it, so and we didn't go back every single year. It was so many years in between. But this past year, it was the 75th year of the, uh, of the uh, incarceration. So it says, well, we all went as a group of, I think there were about 14, 15 of us, of my family. And uh, we went to pay respect to him and just went out to the uh, desert and enjoyed the desert just for him. That's so interesting because for a lot of Japanese Americans, the camps were like the, almost the low point. Yes. And you know, it was such an incredible injustice. So to spread your husband's and his wish to have his ashes spread mm -hmm. at Manzanar's. Loved, he loved Manzanar. Really? Manzanar. Mm -hmm. He loved Manzanar. He loved that. He wrote stories about, he, write, he wrote uh, uh, every month for a, for a periodical at uh, Eastern California Museum, which is about 14 miles north of um, the, the big in, uh, uh, interpretive center. And um, he worked there for 20 some odd years, I think, putting things into the camp, into the museum, to show everything, everyone that he experienced a life there. He put pictures, he made all different things. He went all over you know, to uh, uh, Los Angeles County seeking out people who lived in camp and begged them to give up some of the things that they had in camp, they made or they borrowed or given, and he made up that uh, uh, museum exp um, display at the Eastern California Museum, and they uh, called it the Manzanar Project, and it's, they're still taking care of it and showing it to the public, and I'm very proud of what he did. Wow, I had no idea. <laughs> And I, I think your kids are also here, right? Oh, yes. I have three of my five children here. Mm -hmm. Can you stand up? And I have nieces and, wow. and cousins. Okay. And, uh, yeah. My one son in um, uh, Encinitas could not make it. And uh, my eldest, my daughter in uh, Half Moon Bay up in San Francisco area, area could not make it. but. Uh, I'm so proud that three came to support me, and my nieces and my nephews, and oh, I'm just so proud. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so, as a sansei, I wasn't born until after the camps, and, and I had always so much anger about it. I could never understand, because my family did have an affection 
for their time there. I used to get so mad at them. Oh, why aren't you pissed off like I am? And they were angry, but I think because they built something there. Mm -hmm. So you built a legacy, cultural legacy there, and your husband mm -hmm. not only built a life there, but then he kept that history going. Yes. So it's a, it's it's kind of a, a different way of looking at that experience. Yeah, he. Um said, if it wasn't for a camp, I never would have met you, he said. I never would have had these, fine, these children, and wouldn't have all these relatives. I mean, he had all his brothers and sisters there, too. They, and, and they had their family. One sister had 10 children. She had eight when she went there. She had two more when she was here, when she was there. And they're all just, just just good family, and they, they, they made a good life in uh, being part of the community and, and, and not harboring ill thoughts. They made the best of it by being positive. And so my husband always said, I want to be buried. Uh, you know, when he, when we first bought the, excuse me, the property uh, for our burial, we were going to be buried right by his father and mother, who, who, was already in, who were in camp also. And then after a while, we started working for the museum. He says, you know, I want my ashes strewn over the Sierras, because that's where I want to be. Yeah. So that's what we did. The kids honored him and just. I think Cody is pointing out uh, a. At the doctor? exhibit at the Eastern California Museum, ah. there's a plaque honoring your husband. Mm -hmm. and it has this quote, in Manson are so close to freedom, but yet so far, you could corral my body, control my movements, but not my spirit. Yeah, that was something he, he firmly believed in. He uh, made that up, and that's what we remember him by. He's, he was a very compassionate man. And he was a poet? No, he oh. just loved to write. He just loved to write. <laughs> that's a poet. <laughs> so he used to write for newspapers and things. He just did you know, little, little gossip things and tid, tidbits, even recipes and stuff. But uh, about, uh, he just really enjoyed people. Really enjoyed people. He was a friendly old guy. You said earlier that he saw you singing, and then he yeah. knew. You know, when I was 14 years old, I sang at a talent show in Los Angeles. At the, they called it Nisei Week in those days, and they still do, I guess. But but, uh, but uh, I was up on that big stage that's not even there anymore, but I was singing as a 14-year-old. I think I sang Liebesfrom in Japanese, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I still remember some of the, some of the words. But anyway... He's sitting there in the audience with a beautiful young lady, in, almost engaged to her. He, she went to another camp, which was, he made him, made him very sad. And, uh, but he heard me singing, he says, he points, he says, I'm gonna marry that girl. Whoa, whoa, whoa what a two-faced, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it came true. So the fellow who came to inter uh, introduce me to him for our, our, our um, blind date, he was our, the best man for our wedding, right in camp. Yeah. So Cody, you made an interesting decision to really not only make a film about Mary's um, career as a, a singer, but also a love story. And which is not the obvious way of approaching something like, you know, this great injustice of, of these concentration camps. Can you talk about making that decision as a filmmaker? Well, it kind of came into place when Mary played the recordings that she had of herself singing in camp. There's the one song where you hear Louis Frizzell accompanying her, and then the other song where your husband sent you the lyrics to a poem. You were out of Manson and decided to send a recording of you singing those words back to him while he was still incarcerated. And <clears throat> You know, I, I, I heard the story, which I wasn't aware of before meeting her, and it just it had to be in it. I was interested in what music meant to Mary, and this was a big part of it. Maybe uh, either one of you can answer this. Lou Frizzell, who I think had a great career, actually, yes. in Broadway, and mm -hmm. why in the hell did he go to Manzanar? I mean, what was his, why did he make that decision? He was a student at UCLA. He was about the same age as my, my, my uh, husband, in, in his uh, 20s, 22 or three, I guess, when he went to camp, when they were looking for volunteers to go to the camps to um, become teachers, to 
in whatever subject they were good at, and uh, he decided he was going to go teach music in Manzanar, and he volunteered. And what a blessing. He was so prolific in his writing and his music, was so, and a lovely voice. And, uh, uh, but he took me under his wings, and he nurtured me to sing different kinds of songs, and whether it was swing songs or lovely ballads or blues or whatever. Not too many blues. I didn't sing blues till I got old. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he, was, he was just a wonderful person. And he wrote a song for me, and I still have his original music that he wrote. It is a song about the camp life in Manzanar for teenagers and uh, the lack of privacy and what they, how they may do with whatever we, we could with no, uh, no theaters and no proms and things like that that the, the, the uh, uh, average teenagers would have if they were out of camp. And then, so I was very proud to be chosen to sing a song that he wrote, and I, I still sing it at different places. Wow. And it's called The Man's Nar. He wrote it as, um, it's called When I Can. It's about this young man lamenting about the lack of privacy and what he could, could do and could not do. And, but I always lovingly called it the Manzanar song. Mary, did, did you know him after Manzanar? Pardon me? Did you know him after Manzanar? Did I know of him? No, did, no, did, did you, you stay in touch with him? him? Oh, I did see him a, a couple of times at, uh, at reunions, our high school Manzanar reunions. And then, um, then we used to go to a restaurant in Japanese town and he would meet me there and he'd play the piano and I would sing in the bar and, and oh, wow. we'd, we had fun. What yeah. bar was that? That was at the Kawafuki. Uh, oh. Kawafu no, Kawafu no. Kawafuki. No. No, no, it was not Kawafuku. Um, East West? No, no, it's, not, it's no longer there. What was the name? What was the uh, restaurant now, uh, Lisa? Tokyo Kaikan. Oh. It had, oh, they had a sushi bar, tempura bar, shabu shabu, and what else? Uh, <laughs> there are four. Anyway, and so we take, I don't we take know, the, yeah. the family there and, and choose whatever uh, bar you want to sit at. And it was a wonderful experience. Nick, he used to love to entertain. He used to love to take people there to uh, entertain and feed them. And he, he was just a fun guy. So, you know, I, I grew up listening to the stories of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated. I always wondered what did the other non-Japanese Americans when they saw, you know, their neighbors being taken away. So, did Lou ever talk to you about his kind of his response to seeing Manzanar, to seeing all these people behind barbed wire? Not that I recall, Never. but I know the way he nurtured all the students and and gave them a positive attitude and he made life so much better for us teenagers in camp and we really owe him a lot and um he he had a, a an elderly father who, who lived in Shafter, and he would um go visit him on certain times of the year and uh, uh and report to him what what's going on and, and he told him that i'm in love with one of the girls there and um and so when, I went, when my husband and I went to interview him after he was um, involved with the museum um, story, um, he says, are you the one my son was in love with? I says, no, <laughs> you know, because never, never. I, I went to a dance and danced with him, but nothing like that. But I was thinking of another gal that I know of that might have touched his uh, heart. <laughs> but uh, it, well, he was, he was, he was, wow. he was because he was the same age as my son. Manzanar. Yeah, his husband was six years older than I, and so he was considered an old guy compared to, you know, <laughs> me, but uh, we hit it off. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I think we can open it up to questions from the audience for Cody and Mary. Uh huh. It's a question for Mary. I'm so curious about Oh, yes, uh-huh. And so how were you rounded up, and what were you allowed to take, and what happened to all, everything that you couldn't take? And then the same thing, how did you reintegrate? Where did you go back to the and how was that transition? Did everybody hear the question? No. Um, well, let me, you 
you know, I think my, my job is done here, so I'll be the mic person. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll try to condense it. Um, I, I want to understand um, what it was like to being ripped away from everything you knew at home, how the mechanics of how you were all rounded up, what could you take, what did you have to leave behind, and then coming out of the camp, how did you reintegrate what seemed different, what seemed the same, how did people treat you? Well, we were notified by posters put on telephone poles saying, all Japanese people of this area have to be at this certain place and you're all gonna be sent to a, a camp. So we just followed. We didn't, we didn't have rabble rousers in, in those days. And we just did what we were told to do and we went peacefully. Only what we could carry. We could not ship anything because we didn't have the, uh, the facilities to ask for anybody to take things for us. So whatever we could put into duffel bags or suitcases or whatever, only what we could carry. And um, babies, whatever they could take in diapers so they couldn't take anything else, they needed diapers. And so, and they could not take food, you know, because it was gonna be a long trip on a bus. And uh, once we got there, we were told where to go, what barrack to get into, and kids who had uh, to go to school were told to go to this place at a certain time of the day, and we had school, schools, and uh, you had to go to mess halls to eat. And then they told us when the war stopped, I mean, when the war was over, they said, now you can go home. But we had no home. Everything was gone. And so they gave you $25 each. So, okay, go make a life for yourself, you know? So we had no place to go. There are places that would accept the uh, return of uh, the incarcerees at hostels and things, but or they, if they had friends from before, that they would let them stay at their place or find a place for you to stay. In those days, it was pretty hard to find lodgings because all those servicemen were all coming back. And um, and the funny thing is, the barracks were dismantled, and only the servicemen could buy the lumber so they could build a home when they came back because there was no no building. Uh, facilities for them to start life anew for them either. But we had absolutely nothing. And uh, so, but when we could find a job, I took a job as a um, housekeeper. My husband took a job as a gardener. Well, I was not married yet. We, went, we left camp in January of 45. My husband came out in March of 1945. And um, he didn't have a job. He used to be a farmer. And he didn't have a job, so he used to work as a gardener, go on a bus. He used to catch a bus to go to the gardening jobs and use the family's tools to do the gardening. And lately, later on, he was able to borrow some money, and he bought a little car, and he was able to do his gardening then. And I kept on being a housekeeper until I got pregnant. And so uh, then we moved to... a where the, family, the rest of the family of, uh, lived in. But we had actually uh, nothing, nothing when we get back, went back to us at camp, so. How were you treated by society? Oh, my, there's a professor of, of, at the Caltech who took my brother under his wing and, and took him to Caltech to, to teach, uh, to study there. And um, he sponsored us from camp and he um, uh, found a place for us to rent and gave my brother a job. And then he said, well, you, you and Shai, my husband's name was Shiro, but his nickname was Shai. So you and Shai are, get, are, mar are getting married, so I'm gonna go buy you a birth, um, wedding present. So he took me to Buffum's. I believe it was Buffum's, that was a long time ago. And we picked up a little stainless steel saucepan. And the lady who was, well, helping us, she says, she looked at me, she says, you're not one of those dirty Japs, are you? And so the professor was so angry, he put that pot down and we both walked out. And we encountered that. And then when I was, well, before we went to camp, one of the teachers knew that we were all gonna be evac evacuated. <sighs> when are you gonna leave? When are you gonna leave here? And I'll never forget that. It was a teacher in high school. He says, when are you going to leave? I never did anything to them. Jeez. <laughs> but 
that's how it was. And, uh, and people would stare at us. And I, 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 I uh, in, enrolled at Pasadena JC when I first came out of camp. And I just couldn't take it. People were staring at me because there weren't any, there's only one Japanese girl at PC, uh, uh, Pacific, um, PJ, P, P, yeah, I can't remember the name. Uh, but, um, and, and I was the only other Japanese girl there, so they would stare at me and I just felt so uneasy. So I quit, I quit. And so I never got education after high school. So, but I did graduate high school in Manzanar. <laughs> but it was not fun. Any other questions? How did that man find you who took you and your brother under his wing to take care of you? Oh, Professor um, uh, came to Manzanar. He was a professor of agriculture, of, uh, uh, I guess, agriculture. And uh, he, um, um, they were growing a, a native guayuli plant, which the people in Manzanar processed and made, as, um, not a recipe, a formula to make rubber because rubber was not available for the country. Because they, they, it was all coming out of, a, a, a whole, my niece is here, she's, her father's the one with that. that uh, uh, where was that jungle where they were getting the uh, rubber? Amazon. Amazon. No, not the Amazon. Indonesia. Around Indonesia area, yes. Uh huh. Sumatra, I don't know. I, I guess she would know, but I wouldn't know. But anyway, so they, in camp, developed a formula to grow rubber in synthetic rubber, which is better than the American-made uh, synthetic rubber, which to his, almost to his dying days, he was demonstrating to the public, he got this guayuli plant, it's like a sagebrush type thing, and put into this home blender and grind it up with this formula, and after it's done, he would pick out this rubber little mass and bounce it like a ball. It actually bounced, and they made stoppers for sinks and things like that, but the uh, were stymied by the big uh, gas, uh, elect gasoline, uh, petroleum company, the United States Petroleum, it put a bosh on that, and they would not be able to do it. But this professor was a very supportive person, and uh, his name was Dr. Uh, Eber Emerson, and, um, he just had an untimely death, and, uh, and, but he's the one that nurtured my, husband, my uh, brother and gave him a job at Caltech to further his education. And he's the one that sponsored us and found a home for us, and we owe him our future from camp to him. Any further questions? This will be the last one. So, Auntie Mary, how did you first begin singing again? When did you start singing again after camp? Well, after um, the camp, and I think the first place I sang at was at a big public dance at Rogers something, I forgot. Big, uh huh. And, uh, and I sang a song that was current at that time, and that was the first time I sang after camp. But then, Later on, they would have things at uh, Japanese town in Little Tokyo or, or commemorating some kind of thing, and they would ask me to sing. And then, then after a while, I started having kids. And so I said, I'm too lazy, I'm too busy to be singing. So for a long time, I did not sing. And then around, around 2000, maybe a little bit earlier, uh, a, gr a gr group called the Grateful Crane was putting on a show, uh, a play of uh, the camp life, and they put out songs of, the, of that era, and, and they needed an old geezer that was, uh, you know, of that era, so they asked me to sing, and so I sang a couple of songs in that uh, uh, show, and I owe it to them for me, for taking me out of the mothballs and <laughs> letting me sing. <laughs> and I owe it to, and Scott is, is the young man who's, Accompanying me today is he is uh, the the number one piano player, uh, the accompanist. So Mia, thank you for the segue. It's a perfect segue into. Uh, I think now Mary and Scott Scott Nagatani are going to perform. Um, I hate to see that evening.
Hear it for the songbird of Manzanar. song that I sang with the uh, Great Procrane group when we were touring uh, in the Camp Dance show. Uh, and one of the ladies there, she said, oh, the insult, Keiko. Good. 
gather round me, everybody. Gather round me while I preach some, feel a sermon coming on me. The topic will be sin, and that's what I'm again. If you wanna hear my story, well, settle back and just sit tight while I start reviewing the attitude of doing right. You got a accent to hate the positive, healing. Eliminate the negative and I latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mr. In Between. You gotta spread joy up to the maximum. Bring gloom down to the minimum and have faith. A pandemonium's liable to walk upon the scene. To illustrate my last remark. Jonah in the whale, Noah in the ark. What did they do? Just when everything looked so dark. Man, they said we better accent to make the positive alien. I make the negative and I latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mr. In Between. No, don't mess with Mr. In Between. To illustrate my last remark, Jonah in the whale, Noah in the ark. What did they do? Just They said we better accent to eat the positive, eliminate the negative, and I latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mr. In Between. No, don't mess with Mr. In Between. No, don't you mess with Mr. In Between. Thank you everyone for coming.